one, two, three, four has got, an, I've heard this talk, it's absolutely fascinating about the development of some rather interesting um, building techniques in the northeast of England. Four floor is yours. Right, uh, John and Benjamin Green, architects and engineers. John was born 1787 here, Newton Fell House. This is um, west of Newcastle towards Corbridge. I'm sure it didn't look quite so neat and tidy in 1787. His father, uh, William Green, was an agricultural implement maker. He was a, a, also a carpenter and a builder and was obviously quite a, a prosperous man. Um, he, he was doing well. The agricultural revolution was going on in the late 18th century, the invention of the Rotherham plough and the threshing machine. And he was, for example, a subscriber to Aeneas Mackenzie's uh, descriptive account of Newcastle upon Tyne, 1827. You can see him listed, um, I think he's number six down on the right hand side. William Green, builder of Corbridge. And John uh, Green was working for him in, in, in his teens, although I don't think people had teens in those days. Um, and uh, his, his work for his father really had, had a great influence um, on his attitude to life and his work, particularly his work as an architect. When you've worked for a builder, uh, you're very conscious of, of cost. And so now looking at the map of Northumberland, um, the, the real beneficiaries of the industrial and agricultural revolutions uh, were the landowners, the Duke of Northumberland, the Greenwich Hospital Estate, uh, which was um, expropriated from the state of the Earl of Derwentwater, who supported the uh, 1715 uprising, and the Beaufront Estate. And of course, there were the other estates uh, in Durham that uh, John Green uh, became involved with. Um, in his, when he was about 30 or, or a little younger, he started to work as an architect uh, rather than a builder. And his first building uh, was this, Stifford Hall. And uh, it, clearly it's been extended a great deal. Uh, but John's, Welford describes John's style as plain, severe and economical and describes him as a plain, practical, shrewd man of business. And this was very much his uh, background, his built background in building that informed his, his work as an architect. Uh, this is the stables of that building, which is really pretty flamboyant by, by John's standards, uh, as you'll see later on. He moved to Newcastle in 1820. This is Oliver's map of 1830 and was practicing or doing his best to practice as a young architect um, in the city. And he got one job that, that uh, was very useful to him. And I think he learned a lot doing this. It was the Cresswell Hall, this lovely building uh, near the coast, uh, designed by John Shaw, who was based in London, unfortunately demolished in, in 1931. It was one of the, the great houses of Northumberland. And working as site architect, I think he learned a great deal. But his breakthrough came when he won the uh, competition for the design of the Literary and Philosophical Society's Library in 1822, in competition with 12 others. And uh, he won it primarily on, on price. And he actually had to borrow uh, the book about uh, Greek revival architecture from the library in order to be able to complete his design. But it, it, it's, it's certainly a fairly stark building. And um, Freemasonry was a very important part of professional life um, in Newcastle and the Northeast uh, in the 19th century. The society had shared premises with the Freemasons and the laying of the foundation stone of the library was a tremendous uh, Masonic event. Uh, down below you can see Mackenzie's description of, of what went on and the, the dinner lasted from five o'clock till nine o'clock uh, and certainly with 35 toasts and 53 speeches it must have been uh, quite something. And the Duke of Sussex who was the, the head, head of the uh, Freemasons came to, to that and his uh, 
his uh, portrait still hangs over the stairs as you go up uh, into the library. And, and the building itself uh, looks uh, quite Masonic in its design. Uh, and above the description um, of, the, of the Masonic ceremony, um, you can see mention of um, Jack Lanton, who again is someone we'll come to later uh, this evening. So John was, he was a competent draftsman, nothing very special. These are his drawings in the Lang Art Gallery. I quite like the, the one bottom right, but they're, they're a, a little indistinct. And like any young architect, he was looking to take on any work he could get hold of in the early um, 1820s. This building that came to a rather sad end uh, in, the, in the 2010s was a Presbyterian chapel Clavering Place round behind the station. And this, of course, was what was going on in Newcastle uh, in the 1820s and 1830s, round the corner um, in 4th Street, the Rocket. Other, another little job uh, he uh, picked up was to build the Scotch Church in Blackett Street, or at least its front facade. And that's his design on the left. On the right, uh, we have from Comp Pugin's uh, Augustus Welby Pugin's contrasts. We have um, Pugin's idea of how not to build a church, which looks remarkably like uh, um, John Green's design. And Pugin, someone we're also going to meet later. But in the 1820s, the majority of John's work was farm buildings. And we're very fortunate that um, Loudon's Encyclopedia has 21 pages of John's design. Uh, with specifications and costings. That's very John Green. And it says over um, on the right hand side how John Green Esquire of Newcastle, the first architect, as we are informed, for farm buildings in the extensive counties of Northumberland and Durham. So he was building these farms. And when you look at uh, the pages of Loudoun, you can see the design of the farm and you can see the axonometric uh, bottom left. And when you go to East Cocklaw Farm, and particularly when you look at it on Google Earth, it's all still there, um, very much as John's design. And you can see top right, uh, the, the barn at the rear, uh, um, of just like the axonometric um, bottom left. And there are also, you can see all these costings and specifications. Then you go to another one, Hallington New Houses, the same thing. Uh, you look on Google Earth and there's a good chunk of it left. Loudon um, uh, was astonished at how poor the accommodation for the farm workers was and how luxurious the accommodation for the livestock was. And here's another one. I'm not absolutely certain that this is John Green, but I suspect it is. This is Thornborough High Barns. Um, and again, when you look at the plan and then you look at Google Earth, it's, it's pretty much all still there. And then uh, towards the end of the 1820s, John start to, started to work for the Duke of Northumberland. This is the, the model farm, Park Farm uh, near Annick. And if you look top left, you can see this is, this is John's stark economical classicism, uh, which, which I find very attractive. It's really stripped down. And this is, it's, this is a lovely building, but also I like the barns. I mean, even are the, these fairly sort of workaday buildings, um, there are nice little details. This is Ingram Farm, which is right up in the Ingram Valley, um, which uh, doesn't look all that different from what it must have, at least in my two photographs, bottom left and right, uh, pretty similar to what it looked like uh, not long after 1826. And this is Thornborough Kiln Farm. And when you look at a farm like this, you realize that it's actually an agricultural factory. Um, the, the landowners were onto such a good thing because they, they owned the mines, not just coal mines, but also lead mines, uh, uh, you know, up in the hills. And as well as owning the mines, they, they were uh, producing uh, what was needed, the provisions to, to feed the miners and the industrial workers on their various other enterprises. 
And uh, I went to the Duke's um, archive in Annick Castle, which is absolutely full of John Green drawings, enormous farms like this one. I'm not sure where this is. And also fairly uh, mundane little buildings, nice little buildings designed by John Green. And still there pretty much on the right hand side, uh, almost uh, exactly as, as designed. So here's a list on the left hand side of John Green's farms. And I wouldn't be surprised if you could double that number. And they were, I mean, there, some of these farms are really big. I mean, 28 horses, that is quite some establishment. So there, the farms are on the left and on the right, we move over to his bridges. And looking at this list, the thing that strikes you is, is the different types of bridge. Um, masonry bridges, sus iron suspension bridges, and the laminated timber bridges uh, for which John Green is famous. So starting to look at his, his bridges, his first work, 1825, um, Captain Sam Brown um, had his patent on suspension bridges was 1817. And this is a very ambitious um, scheme for a bridge across the Tyne uh, between North and South Shields. And John, because uh, Sam Brown uh, basically kept to, to his, uh, his chains, uh, John had designed the, the piers for the bridge. This is Brown's Union Bridge of 1820, which is at the moment being repaired. And so by 1830, John was building his own suspension bridges. This is the surviving bridge over the Tees at Walton near Barnard Castle. And it's, it's a very nice little bridge actually. It's a little alarming when you drive across it because there's a kind of wave goes across in front of you. Um, and uh, I do slightly worry about this bridge, but uh, it's amazing, it's still there, it's extraordinary. And this is the 1831 Tyne Bridge, only replaced in 1967, although it had been repaired beforehand. And bottom left, uh, here we are on our way to the Bladen Races. And in the Discovery Museum, uh, which I must say is a wonderful place and you must visit when you're in Newcastle, on the left, you have the claret jug that John Green was given um, when he had designed and built the, the Scotswood Bridge. And on the right, they have some of the pieces of the, uh, the, the chain assembly of the Scotswood Bridge. But the museum is full of other wonderful things. Um, Moving on just gradually uh, to masonry bridges, this is a page from Cap of Captain Sam Smith's notebook in the ICE Library, Institution of Civil Engineers. Uh, he was checking John Green's estimate for a suspension bridge at Blackwell over the Tees. Um, but what was actually built eventually was this bridge, which I think is John Green's best um, masonry bridge. And you can see, if you look at the underside, it was widened later on. You can see it's in two halves. And it is very nice, particularly the, the cutaway intrados, which are called Horn de Vache intrados, um, that give it a really nice profile. And again, you can, you can see that how it was widened later. And he was building a, a number of other masonry bridges, nice sturdy looking bridges. This is Billingham Bridge, 1834 over the North Tyne. And this is Nether Poppleton Bridge, 1839, over the Yorkshire Ouse. John Green had a reputation of being able to deal with foundation problems. He'd done work on St Nicholas in Newcastle successfully. And it, I find it extraordinary that this bridge is still carrying the main line from London to Edinburgh, uh, particularly if you think in the 1970s of Deltic uh, locomotives thundering over this bridge. It really has done pretty well. Uh, it is held together by these various ties and you can see the parapet's got a bit of a dip in it, but hasn't it done well? Now moving on to the laminated timber viaducts. This is the drawing from the paper in the ICE proceedings that uh, the, the, the paper was delivered by Benjamin Green 
um, but was uh, about John Green's uh, bridges. And these are the two viaducts over the Ousburn and the Wellington. And um, these are the details of those two viaducts across those two burns. Uh, these are the details in uh, the paper. And you can see the substantial laminated um, arches, which are about three foot nine. I'm sorry to be in Imperial, but and uh, are, and I'm just coming on to show you on the next side, which, which is my version of how they're held together with oak tree nails. And you can see that the deals are staggered and there's an arrangement of tree nails at four foot center holding them together. And here we've got Oosburn Vardak 1839. And uh, the, the laminated timber looks great, but also the piers look great too. And this is Willington today. And again, the piers look good. And the laminated timber uh, was replaced by iron. But the laminated timber had done its job because it had uh, raised uh, um, money from the um, uh, receipts of the, of the railway from Newcastle to North Shields. Um, and it was never envisaged that the laminated timber would last very long. So the question arises of how long and it was about 30 years, uh, um, 1869, at least one of the viaducts was replaced then. Because <clears throat> laminated timber is actually, it, it's, it's, it, it's not good in terms of, you can't replace bits of it um, as you could with some of Brunel's timber bridges. And so you really had to replace the whole thing. But this bridge here, uh, which is um, at the Shildon Railway Museum, is the Borough Road Bridge of 1843 by Nicholson, and that survived much longer. It was a road bridge rather than a railway bridge, so it didn't have such uh, heavy loads and, and uh, oscillating and uh, uh, loads on top of it. Um, so, and it lasted quite well. I, it's a shame that they that um, that it's outside at Shildon. Um, the, the question arises: Where did John Green get his ideas? And, and I think really. Uh, they, they were his own ideas. There were other similar things happening elsewhere. On the continent, uh, Armand Rosemi, who was a wonderful engineer, was building his riding schools uh, for the French army in the 1820s. Um, this is one of them um, in Libourne, which is still there, rather wonderful building. Um, but I don't think, because John Green was already designing his bridges in the 1820s, I don't think it's likely that he knew of Emmy's work at that time, but I think he probably did by about 1840, because uh, in, uh, in the paper to the civils, they refer to riding schools, and uh, I don't think they built any riding schools, so I think it's reasonable to assume that they were uh, thinking about Emmy's work. This is the Greens' unbuilt scheme for the high-level bridge at Newcastle. Of course, we've got the, the Stevenson Bridge, uh, the wonderful Stevenson Bridge, uh, which uh, has lasted longer than the Greens Bridge would have lasted. This is an unbuilt scheme for the railway over the Tweed. So he had a lot of uh, schemes for bridges that weren't built. Now we come to Benjamin. Rather different from his father, Colvin uh, describes him as an artistic and dashing sort of fellow, his style ornamental, florid and costly, very different from his father, and he certainly looks rather dashing in this, uh, in this picture. And he, rather remarkably, was sent down to London um, to the drawing school of Augustus Welby Pugin's father, Augustus Charles, to learn to be an architect. He wasn't there for all that long, and he's not mentioned. There's, there's a, a book about the various pupils of Augustus Charles, and I couldn't find any mention of him. But uh, this kind of world must have seemed very different uh, from John Green's world. And he certainly learned a great deal when he was there, as you'll see shortly. And these are the Greens, these are 23 of the Greens churches. Again, I, I'm not sure I've, I've got them all. But you can see they start with John and then gradually they move over to Benjamin. 
And John was building these churches like this, um, unassuming buildings in, in the early 1830s. And then later in the 1830s, having uh, taken on board, not just um, the Pugin's ideas, but, but the change in uh, the, the uh, change with the ecclesiologists and the Oxford movement and so on, and uh, churches were changing. And the Greens were building these really quite ambitious churches. This is Holy Trinity Stockton and St Hilda in Middlesbrough. Uh, but these churches had never succeeded in attracting the, the congregations that their builders would have liked them to, to have. And so they're now, they're now all gone. This is one St Alban Earsden, 1836, uh, happily still there. And it's a kind of cut down uh, version of, of a, a Pujin uh, um, example. And this is St. Mary the Virgin, Rye Hill, 1858. This is, in, uh, is entirely uh, Benjamin Green because John had died by this time. But again, it's, I mean, it's a vast building. The, the, the upkeep of these kind of buildings uh, is, uh, well, I mean, if you, <laughs> Is, is uh, a, a great deal of money is needed and the congregation was never there. Um, John Green and, and perhaps Benjamin too are still building little churches. This is Seghill 1849, but there are two that interest me very much. This is Holy Trinity Cambo, the first one, 1842, would interest me um, because of its roof. In the Sybil's paper, there are some drawings uh, on, on the left-hand side, that's the roof of the North Shields station um, on, the, on the railway. And on the right-hand side is a blow up of the roof of Cambo Church. So when I went there, I looked at the ceiling on the bottom left and thought, oh, I wonder if the laminated timber is still there. And when the church warden uh, was very helpful and got me up on a ladder, to look uh, on the bottom right, I could see that yes, it is just uh, underneath the, uh, this, hidden by the ceiling. So this is the oldest surviving Victorian laminated timber roof uh, that I'm aware of. And this is another one, 1844 um, in uh, Horsley, which is right up in Reedsdale. And here you can see the laminated timber very clearly. So uh, working for the Duke, the, um, John Green became the Duke's architect. And this is a typical sort of letter of, of John to the Duke's agent, talking about the typical sort of job that, that John was building, which is Lesbury Mill uh, on, uh, near, near the um, outflow of the, uh, the, of the River Ulm. And here again, you can see typical, typical John, uh, a, a, a stripped down, but a, but a bit of classism in there. And they were doing all sorts of other work for the Duke. I suspect this is Benjamin. This is schemes for Tynemouth. The, the Duke had uh, owned a, a, a large chunk of Tynemouth. And here are villas that they might have built in Tynemouth. I'm sure Loudon would have approved of these. And now we come back to Newcastle in 1830. This is, we're back to Oliver's map. And these are the three men who were instrumental in the rebuilding of central Newcastle, Granger, Dobson, and Clayton. Uh, Dobson, Dobson was really the leading architect uh, rather than John Green uh, in Newcastle. He tended to get the plum jobs, the big country houses rather than John Green. But uh, the Greens were quite important in the transformation of the center of Newcastle. Here we've got Collard, where it's where it's all where all the central part has been rebuilt, and here you've got Grey Street, and the the two the focus of Grey Street, uh, the the monument, and also the Theatre Royal, were John and Benjamin Green's buildings, in particular Benjamin Green's buildings. So here we have them uh, in a on a Collard print, and these are the drawings of the Theatre Royal because it's a tremendous block uh, of, of building. And uh, on the bottom right, you can see the queen post roof over the, over the, uh, the stalls, etc. And so they weren't just good at laminated timber, they could do a pretty fine truss. 
that looks just great. And so here's the, the green uh, block of building. And then we have the gray monument. I, I mean, I, again, the, the, the political figures in the Northeast were very important this, this time. Uh, Gray himself and also Lampton, who I'll come to later, were important in that uh, the Reform Act and the abolition of slavery uh, uh, went through during uh, Gray's time as Prime Minister. And Lampton, well, I'll talk about Lampton later. So this is a list of the, their main buildings. I mean, these men were just absolute, I mean, how much work did they get done? Extraordinary. And when you look at some of Benjamin Green's buildings, I think the Joint Stock Bank on the left-hand side is just a terrific building. And the facade of the uh, Theatre Royal uh, also, it's just, it's just great, isn't it? Now, I think the rather extraordinary coincidence that the, um, I think it was the eighth meeting of the British Association for the Advancements of Science took place in Newcastle in 1838. The president was actually uh, the Duke of Northumberland. And it's a tremendous list of, of uh, dignitaries here. And there were sectional uh, committees and the Greens were involved in the mechanical science. And when you look at the list of people that uh, on the, the, the officers, I mean, Babbage was the president, then you've got Donkin, George Stevenson, you've got Vignoles as the secretary. And even more extraordinary, the corresponding members are just, it's amazing. There's uh, Alexander von Humboldt and Liebig, uh, a, an extraordinary group of people. And then on the right-hand side, where you see mechanical science, uh, second down, you've got Mr. Benjamin Green on the timber viaducts, now in progress. And so they were able to show them these uh, buildings that were being constructed at the time. They were also able to show them the, the models they'd made. They, they were keen model makers. John Green used models to test his laminated bridges. Uh, and uh, there were the, the, of the models at the Associ British Association meeting, quite a, a number were the Green's models. Now we get uh, back to Lampton himself, and, and he's an important and interesting man, having, uh, when he was uh, Governor General of Canada, uh, having written his report uh, suggesting um, that the colony should be self-governing, uh, which was which was something which was an extraordinary thing to do in the 1820s. So we here we have his monument that dominates a large part uh, of County Durham, and this is the local paper uh, description of the um, of the foundation stone laying which was a fantastic, another fantastic um, uh, Masonic event. And I think they say that 20,000 people came with trains from all over Northumberland and Durham, from Gateshead, North Shields. And you can see that uh, the, it was, it was a, a big, very big do. And it's also interesting to compare the um, Lampton Monument uh, with its classicism, with uh, in the same year, the Walter Scott Memorial built in Edinburgh and classicism um, survived late in Newcastle, uh, which I think uh, did Newcastle uh, quite a lot of favors. Now we go on to their railway work. Uh, uh, it's unbelievable that we're going on to yet another <laughs> branch of their work. This is the Newcastle and Berwick Railway. And here we've got George Husband, uh, Hudson, sorry, who uh, was the uh, uh, leading light in the construction of the railways uh, in, in the Northeast. And on the left, we've got a piece of Bradshaw showing the, uh, the stations. And they were built by Benjamin in this, uh, 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 not, is it uh, Jacobean stroke Tudor style? Looks much more, it's suddenly becoming much more Victorian, isn't it? And they're really nice little buildings, solid. Acklington and Chathill. And there's a wonderful station, there's a little line that goes down from Berwick down to um, Kelso and the Norham station uh, is still full of the, the kit is all, all still there, well worth a visit. So uh, now we come to think about, about their, well, how they saw themselves. 
In the 1841 census, John comes first and describes himself as an architect. 1851, Benjamin is the head of the household and they describe themselves as architectural engineers. So I, they thought of themselves uh, as, as, I mean, the professions hadn't really split up to the same extent. Um, John became a member of the ICE, but, but only in 1840. Um, clearly earlier, he, he either saw himself more as an architect or, or hadn't yet uh, uh, appreciated his, his work as an engineer. So he became a, a member when the Institute of British Architects was founded in 1834 and a fellow in 1839. Benjamin was only ever uh, a, really an architect. So this is um, John's uh, will, and he makes particular uh, mention of the claret jug, which was his, he, he was very concerned that that should go to his son, Benjamin. These um, are letters of Benjamin's in the Annick archive. I'm absolutely no expert at, at deciphering uh, handwriting, but Benjamin went into fairly swift decline after the death of his father. He, he was, uh, had a talent um, for uh, not getting on with people. And uh, for instance, his cousin who wanted to become his partner, he, he wasn't having any of that. And he uh, fell out with people left, right and center and, uh, ended, and, and uh, ended up in, in an asylum and died uh, just six years after his father. Uh, it's difficult to know, I mean, impossible to know uh, the, the reasons. I mean, uh, one can't help thinking that, uh, you know, some kind of burnout was a, a possibility. So there we have them, John and Benjamin Green, two uh, perhaps very, very different men, but both very talented in their own spheres. John, a, a, a very good engineer and, uh, Benjamin, a very good architect. And so uh, there I draw to a close, John. Over to you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Paul. It, it, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I always find it interesting how it is possible that at that time you could cover such a wide range of skills. These days, I can't imagine any architect these days being brought in in exactly the same way. Um, as, as the Greens way. The, the, you, you mentioned about uh, Wilton Bridge, it's one I drive over not uh, infrequently and uh, yes as you say it is a rather interesting bridge to drive over particularly if uh, the tease is in Spain. Um, if anyone's got any questions please do feel free to put them to Paul on chat or if you want to and I can identify you, you've got your full name on please put your hand up and I will uh, uh, come through. I'll, Julia just raised a question I'm going to um, raise, I'll let you in, Julia, in 30 seconds. Uh, where's Julia? You can find her. Uh, Julia, do you want to um, unmute Am yourself? I in? Yes, we can hear you now. I'm unmuted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Paul, I thought that was actually really wonderful and that it should certainly be turned into a paper. I mean, really, just because the combination of architects and engineers. I mean, the, just the extent of the work they did. Can I, this is so boring, um, make a minor point. Your thing about that wonderful bridge with what you call Horn de Vache. I Actually, got it wrong. <laughs> Corn de Vache with a C, and it was invented by Perronet for the Neuilly Bridge to ease the passage of floodwaters. What's really interesting is that the only other bridge I know that's got them in this country is actually Telford's Mythe Bridge in Gloucester. And they're corn, they're, you know, um, horns. So you need a C rather than an H. But it's really interesting because I don't, I mean, I was brought up to believe that the Mythe Bridge was the only bridge that had them. And so the Greens somewhere in there must have known about Peronet. Well, perhaps, yeah. I mean, they don't look as if they would um, deflect a great deal of water, I must say. I mean, they're, no, they're quite, they're they quite may small, not have done, they? but I mean, they are, as an architectural detail, it's wonderful. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Yes. I mean, much, much more interesting than just plain old common old arches, elegant yes. as they are. It's a really elegant solution, architecturally. 
we, we have lots of questions coming in. Thank you, everyone. And please, um, John Freeman asks, um, do you know how many employees they have? Um, well, I think very few. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, I mean, Augustus Welby Pugin never dele delegated anything to anyone, did he? I mean, all the all the whole of the Houses of Parliament, you know, all the details he did himself. And these people, they just work. I mean, Pugin uh, was burnt out at a very young age, wasn't he? Uh, I mean, it's their their capacity for. Work. I mean, they didn't have the distractions that we have, but but um, the, their capacity for work was just amazing. I, I think they maybe had three or four. Um, but not, I, I, I can't be certain, but not many. Do you know if they were, they, they obviously had contractors, do you know if they worked with the same contractors each time, or, or were they actually more like the design and build these days and were actually taking on the contracting as well themselves? No, no, they, they, they didn't work, they didn't work as builders. I mean, obviously John Green had worked with his father uh, as, as, a, as a contractor, but um, no, they, they worked as designers. Okay, I mean, John so Green... The, John Green was was a retiring kind of man. I mean, in a way, he was the archetypal, um, you know, rather introverted um, engineer. Back, I mean, you know, in a way, a sort of not exactly back room, but but um, not pushing himself forward. Whereas his son was quite quite the opposite, and his son would do the public speaking. I'm not sure John Green was capable of that. Um, so um, that that was their their, their arrangement. I mean, he wanted to pass his practice, no doubt he wanted to pass work on to his son. Um, and so that was another reason for his son taking, taking the, being the, 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 the front man. Um, Jack Walton uh, says, thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, Gemma would like to ask a question, but um, Gemma, I'll get you and unmute you in two seconds. Um, Richard Piers uh, asks, did the Greens have a consistent group of craftspeople who were executed out, or were the craftspeople appointed by the clients? A little bit repeating what I've. Well, I'm earlier. sorry. I wish I could answer some of these questions, but I, I just, I just don't know. I imagine that someone like the Duke had had his sort of regular builders. Um, I mean, he would have done. Um, but did, what, elsewhere, I, I, I just don't know. Did they, or did they? Do you think the the estate had its own? Well, those very big estates um, often had their their. their Sort of in-house building team, yeah, direct labour. I, I, I don't know about that. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I mean, clearly, you know, someone like Hudson on the on the stations, they they must have had contractors and and so on. But um, okay. I mean, John Green, he really did stay in. I just wanted to mention this. He did really stay in the northeast. I mean, the other engineers, you know, the real the the the, the Brunels, the Locks, and so on. Um, operated nationally and the, the Stevensons, of course, and internationally. But um, John Green uh, stayed in the Northeast. He was a structural engineer, really. He was interested in, in the structures. He, was, he never worked on you know, setting out and the alignment of railways or anything of that kind. The, 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 there's considerable similarities between um, his uh, suspension bridges and, and say, Hawkstow Bridge by, by Rennie uh, you know, down in North Lincolnshire. And, on those lines. It's very similar that at that time you have this whole group of them which were um, had a, a sort of a common style, if you, you might say. Yes, yes. Well, I suppose they were based on 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 Captain Sam Brown's Sam Brown's yeah. uh, designs to or, um, or, or ideas. I mean, I think that North Shields Bridge is just amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's. I mean, you. I mean, you think about something like you know one of the, one of the the. Uh, the bridges of the 1960s or the 1970s. It, it's got that amount of ambition, hasn't it? Yes. Well, is it the, the, that makes it similar. Um, Gemma, Gemma asks, um, do you think that the Greens have been overshadowed as an engineering family by the Stevensons? Well, they're different. They're chalk and cheese, really, aren't they? Uh, uh, you know, the Stevensons. And the Stevensons, I mean, Mike Crimes talks about this, how the Stevensons sort of operated you know, half as designers and half as builders and, uh, you know, <laughs> money changed hands. Um, but um, no, I mean, they're just, they're just very different. I mean, I think the Greens have, uh, have been, well, I, I perhaps overlooked a little, but, um, but they, were, they were men who, uh, local men who did, who did the work in Newcastle and Northumberland. I think one of the most interesting things is the farms, actually. I think the farms are fascinating. Because John Green, 
certainly knew everything about the technology of the farms, you know, how the, they, they've got those circular houses that, that the horse moved around in to power the threshing machine and so on. And, and the farm, I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're very highly tuned buildings, those farm buildings. Well, there is that tradition of these, like farms as a factory up there. It, 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 I'll declare I know those farms quite well. In fact, I'm fairly sure that uh, one of my wife's friends from school actually now probably owns one of them or owns one very close to, to them uh, because they, they moved up there from that part of the world. So, yeah, it is absolutely fascinating up there. It's wonderful and, to go and to meet the farmers, actually, and show them the drawings <laughs> and chat about the farms with them. It's real fun, actually. <laughs> Um, Richard Piers asks, um, you show, um, the Greens work from book, did you, he was asking the, about the reference for the book that you um, got the Greens material from. Well, uh, there, I mean, there are various books. Uh, there's Welford, there's Colvin, there, there's a now a more recent book. Um, and then I've just pieced it together from, from I mean, there's um, uh, Geoffrey Booth, who did a lot of work on laminated timber, wrote about the Greens in the 1970s, and I owe a lot to him in terms of, of looking he, his paper in, in the transactions of the Newcomen Society on laminated timber bridges. I, I owe a lot to him. Um, has anybody else got any more, 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 more questions? Anybody else want to come in on bits and pieces? Of Either raise your hand and I'll come over to you or uh, do put it down on chat. Yeah. But it's, it's actually good that that one section of that bridge has survived at and I must go and have a proper look at it next time I go up there. They're quite surprised when you, when you go there and you ask to look at that bridge. I, th I think I'm the only person that's asked to look at it <laughs> in many, <laughs> many years. <laughs> it is a pity it's outside because it's not doing it any good, but uh, I mean, people go to a rail museum, railway museum to see uh, locomotives, don't they? And, and, and uh, you know, the Duke of Sutherland's railway carriage and things like that. They, they don't, you know, most people don't go to look at a bit of timber. Uh, John Vignoles has asked, um, Charles Vignoles operated a very tight ship and had a small network of assistance he could rely on. He was a, a perennial optimist and also took an interest in, that, in, in all matters of, of, of all fields, I uh, and, and Julia mentioned that the, the, the overriding, um, the, the sort of shadow that people like uh, Brunel have cast over everybody else in that sense. Um, Colin Megson um, commented, what was the political public purse input into the infrastructure pro projects, i.e. how much was private, how much was public money? Or... All right, well, I mean, I mean, there wasn't much public money in those days. Everything was... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was all. Yeah, I mean, it was all raised by you know raised by local. I, I mean, they had they had three types of clients. The Greens, they had the landowners, who were mostly Tories. Although of course people like Earl Grey and and uh, Jack Lampton were, were Whigs. Uh, they had the landowners. They had the the kind of industrialists and and the entrepreneurs like uh, George Hudson. And then they had the churches and all sorts of different churches, of course, you know, Presbyterians and the Catholic, the Catholic emanci emancipation was going on at the same time. And they, they built churches for, for, you know, for every uh, denomination, uh, which, which, is, which is interesting. And uh, I mean, other people like, um, what's his name? Ignatius Bonamy, who, who was a Catholic, was, was also uh, an architect and, uh, and, and bridge designer, in fact. Um, and was building churches. It, it's social mobility. There was a great deal of social mobility at that time, in fact. That's a, that's a very interesting subject. I could go on all night about uh, it. <laughs> Michael, M Michael Webb, Michael, you have a question you'd like to ask. I'm unmuted you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any um, drawings of how they formed the arch on the laminated arches, how, how they bent the timber? Well, well, I mean, I think they just, they, I don't think they used, I mean, you can use heat. I mean, Emmy sure has drawings of, of, of steam, of using steam, but it's actually not the steam that works, it's the heat. So they may have used heat, um, but bending about the minor axis, you don't actually need, it, it's, you don't need a, a tremendous amount of, um, of force to do that, in fact. So I think it's just done, you know, by jacking. 
Um, Fred, 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 Star, Fred, you've got a, a question. Like, I'll, I'll ask you to unmute. You'll mute yourself if you can want to come in. Then, please. Go bottom, bottom right, and just unmute yourself. Click on the. While we wait for Fred to come in, uh, John Clayson's asked. Probably already answered, but were there associates or pupils of the Greens who continued their style or business on a similar lines? Do we know um, where they had their offices and premises? Yes, we do know where, where they had their offices um, in Newcastle. I, I can't remember the precise street at the moment, but, but it, it, it's, it's quite well known, yes, where, where their premises were, yes. Um, so what was the rest of the question? I'm sorry. Um, um, do, do we know if there are any of their pupils or anything else like that? Um, basically managed to um, c continue business afterwards? Well, well, um, Benjamin Green's cousin, who was another John Green, uh, worked as an architect. But as I say, he, uh, he and Benjamin, or Benjamin didn't get on with him because Benjamin didn't really get on with anyone. Um, but, um, and also um, John Green's son-in-law was John Addison, who's quite a famous civil engineer, yeah, yeah. but again, in, in a different line. I mean, he was uh, operating as a civil engineer, uh, I think not as an architect or as a structural engineer like John. So really it, 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 the, the practice died out. I think yeah. Fred, Fred, do you want to come in at this point or? Michael, have you got another question you were going to ask? <laughs> yes, I have, yeah. I, I'm sorry about, about bending this. What type of timber did they use, oak? No, no, it wasn't oak. It was, uh, it's, um, I mean, it's described as deals. It, it's, it's softwood, and probably from Scandinavia or the Baltic. Yeah. I mean, there was a phenomenal amount of timber coming into to, uh, Britain from, from, uh, from, from the Baltic. In the 19th century, I mean, just a phenomenal amount. I mean, all but, the but given, of all given the Victorian the houses in England, were architects and not builders, did, did they give the did they put the owners for bending the arches, the timber arches, on the on the contractor? Oh yes, I mean the the, the contractor yeah. would be doing it. Yes, I mean John Green might well have been uh, instructing them how to do it, or or you know putting it putting uh, you know some kind of putting ideas to them as to how to do it. But um, I mean, he, he'd, 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 he'd used his models and so on and, and tested his models to prove that his bridges um, would work. Oh, they work all right, I know. A <laughs> um, couple more questions in. Um, Colin Megson asked, are there any surviving technical calculations? Huh? Well, they, they didn't do. I mean, they didn't do calculations for the. They did calculations for the suspension bridges. I've tried to puzzle them out, but I can't really make much sense of them, to tell you the truth. Um, but because um, uh, I showed you that the, the Sam Brown's calculations. I mean, I ought to make a greater effort. But um, I, I, when when I looked at them briefly, I couldn't make much sense of them. Um, I mean, the, the, the book that's come out about the Union Bridge quite recently might have some detail. I've got it and, and I, I can't remember if it's got any details. Uh, I mean, a suspension bridge, but the laminated timber, they, they didn't do any, any, any calculations. I mean, Vigneault, I mean, British engineers didn't really believe in calculations, did they? In, in the, or not much anyway, in, you know, when Vigneault went to uh, university college, he, he He's, you know, no mathematics, certainly not. So the, um, if you, the only calculations I know from that period, which are quite fascinating, is uh, when uh, George Leather was building his uh, tied arch, tied arch bridges in Leeds, there was a lot of dispute over where they're strong enough. And he actually um, sets out his calculation technique and it's published in the, the local paper. Yeah. That's the only time I've ever seen any published calculations anywhere for bridges. And I'm thinking, well, it's, they were rather basic. <laughs> Um, John Dither asked, were the Dinting and Broadbottom viaducts on the Manchester Railway by the Greens? No, I don't think so. No. I, I, I mean, other people they... like Locke built a lot of laminated timber bridges. Yeah. Um, so uh, are they by him? I, um, again, if you look at Geoffrey Boo's um, paper on laminated bridges, it'll probably tell you that. And I've got, I've got a copy here, but uh, I'll, I'll look at it later. Of course, Locke had a lot of connections through to the northeast because his father came from the northeast. Okay, he was, Locke was born in Barnsley, but of course, 
Uh, Locke's father uh, had worked as a, uh, a pit deputy in the northeast before moving down to Barnsley, and then his son goes up back up there to, to do more training in the jungle. So there's a very good chance that he saw this work at that time as well. I mean, I'm fascinated by the idea of Benjamin Green going down to London and spending t <laughs> and being taught by the Pugins. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a young man from Newcastle. I mean, he probably had a fairly thick accent, I should think, <laughs> coming down to London and seeing these extraordinary men with, with doing extraordinary things. Yes. <laughs> it must have had an amazing effect on him. That's in the 60s, in the 70s when I first knew it was English. Um, Tony Barber asks, uh, would they have used any bonding between the layers of laminate? Well, they, I mean, they, they didn't have any glue or anything. They, they had this habit of putting um, paper between, between laminations, which I didn't think was a very good idea. I mean, the, clearly the water could get in. I, I mean, especially uh, with uh, where there's a shoe at the springing, and and you know, uh, water could get in. I mean, the only way to put to to, or or usually the way to make a timber bridge, um, um, last any length of time is to put a, a roof over it, like as the ones in America and the ones in Switzerland. You know, if if you. But you can't really do that with a baldac like this. But uh, on a smaller scale bridge, uh, you uh, if you uh, what what they, there's Weber King, wasn't it? Who who built this the in Switzerland, and they the Greens might have known about his bridges because they they feature in Treadgold that was published in 1820. Uh, the, Treadgold doesn't say very much about them, but they're but they're at least mentioned. They may have uh, conceivably have influenced John Green. We we. So getting conscious of time, but I'll take one or two more questions. We've got two more coming in. Um, you, you've got a very good discussion going today, Paul. Um, hang on, let me just check who it was. Um, Paul Thurkell asks, the wooden arches of the Usburn Viaduct were replaced by the current arches in 1869. And the second bridge built alongside, it is worth viewing the viaduct on uh, Stepney Road, where you can note the newer skew bridge. Uh, let's come. Colin makes some comments. Uh, were there any attempts at chemically preserving the wood, painting? Yes, there were. It was it was um, it was cyanized, I think is the, is the right word. Uh, there there were attempts, but I I rather doubt that was very effective. I mean, it's 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 a tricky business trying to protect timber in in that you know with with um, with any kind of treatment really, especially big timbers, but. Um, they lost. They they did their job actually. The the Vardats, and and you can't ask for more than that. Okay. Um. Very very conscious of time. We're getting nearly up to um, half past. Has any if have we got anybody else got any questions? Hang on. Yes. Uh. When Vignal's designed his suspension bridge in Kiev, he sent his calculators to an Irish professional in mathematics to be checked. Um. Paul, I think all I can do at this stage. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Somebody sent in a, um, a very long comment. Richard Piers, by the 19th century, it was expected that aspiring architects would have some experience in the office and established architect, and, and ideally some training in drawing from London. Uh, David Stevenson, Hall Saints Church, Newcastle, attended the Royal Academy in 1782, the first Northeast architect to do so. Dobson received drawing training in London. London offers offered, um, pupillage to aspiring architects. Thank you for that, Richard. Oh, Steve Stevenson was the Duke's architect before John Green, and Dobson trained with Stevenson. But see, John Green had no training with another architect. Uh, I mean, he, he, he really did learn with his father. And, and I think that Cresswell Hall building um, was a, a big learning process for him, too. It's not, it's not so similar to John Green was perhaps unusual. Yeah, it's, it's not that dissimilar to, to John Carr, although he did receive some training as an architect. Really, he cut his teeth on um, uh, Harewood House, and it was really after that that he, he gained all his, his experience where, where his father was uh, supervising him. So it very much, again, it was very much that tradition. Um, Paul, thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, we've had an absolutely um, flood of questions. I, I'm sure that if anybody wants a copy... Um, Paul has got a fascinating paper on laminated timber bridges, uh, limited timber arches, haven't you? That we can... uh, yeah, yeah, well, I, I, the reason I became interested in the Greens is because I'm interested in laminated timber. And um, I wrote a paper 
on the surviving laminated Victorian laminated timber buildings in, in Britain. And that led me to the Greens. Um, so I wrote a paper on that, and then I wrote this paper on, on the Greens. I, I'll actually give, I'll give people, ra rather brave of me, but I'm going to give people my email address. Well, it's okay. I'm going to say, no. so Paul, if, if people come through to me, if, if people come through to me and if they want the paper, please, please uh, drop, drop me an email and I will make sure you get a copy of it in the next day or two. Uh, I'm, I'm tied up tomorrow, but I will try to get it out to you as quickly as possible. Fine. Paul, um, on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, and uh, we look forward to reading your paper uh, in the journal in, in June. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.